A few years ago, two friends of mine were working on a game. This game was going to be the best game out there. It was going to be the next Angry Bird. Their expectations were super high, and actually, it looked very much like this. They were expecting people to come running and knocking down the door with eagerness to play their game. Unfortunately, when they launched, the demand looked more like this. <laughs> but instead of giving up and accepting defeat, they decided, well, hey, let's actually sit down, review the App Store, and really see which gaming experience is missing. And what they found was that the experience of Mario Kart were missing from the App Store. The experience where you would play together synchronously with your friend on your mobile device in real time. So they worked on this concept, eventually named it Fun Run. And when they launched, it still looked like this. <laughs> but this time there were one thing that was very, very different. This time, their friends didn't just play for one day to be nice, they actually continued playing. And they didn't just continue playing by themselves, they also got their friends to start playing. And then we're like, well, if our friends really like this, like even though we didn't get millions of downloads on day one, what if we at least get our whole university to play the game? So they put up a booth, very creative booth, next to the entrance of the cafeteria, so all the students at the university would see. And they actually got one third of the university to download and start playing the game. But with this initiative and a lot of other initiatives, after three months and steady growth, as they reached 300,000 downloads, they, this was the inflection point. They asked users to tweet about hashtag fun run for a chance to win in-game currency. That day, they saw their download numbers double. And with that, uh, the next day, people continued to tweet about the game using the hashtag fun run. And eventually, the uh, hashtag got trending worldwide on Twitter. And with this, and with the synchronous multiplayer experience, they saw people playing in a way that they could only hope for. And this is what you would see if you entered any high school in the US at the time. Oh, yes! Yes! Oh, yes! No! <laughs> Pretty cool, right? And if you were seeing people like that, that it quickly picked on further. Um, so with that, uh, and, and working on a game like that, eventually it hit number one on the App Store. And since then, the, game, the team has worked really hard to maintain its position uh, with the synchronous multiplayer games and have now reached 100 million downloads. I was lucky to be part of that team doing their marketing and business development for a few years and learned a lot about how to grow our user base. But the challenge that we encountered was that we had a very social gameplay. Um, it was hard for us to do pay-to-win features without ruining the gaming experience. So we would always look for ways that the users would do the marketing for us. Because when you look at what the cost of acquiring users, like last report from Fixu to acquiring a good user is $7.5. And the, we were, no, were nowhere near those numbers. And that is actually what we're talking about today. Like, if you don't have the budget that can justify spending like this, what can you do? And that is the thesis for the 10 growth tips. Um, these were we walked through my uh, based on my experience at Fun Run, working with other game companies now through my new company called Megacool and uh, applying this to today's market. So the first thing to think about when you're going to grow through your existing users is that you need to be able to keep your first users so they will do the marketing. Um, then 
one number that is important to remember then is that 80% on average that downloads a game only uh, opens it once, which means that you only have one shot to make them come back and become that evangelist for you. Then why is this usually the first screen that pops up as you download a new game? I find this so surprising because if you think about the motivation of a player, it's on top when you open the game and then this is, this is friction and it just drops for every friction point. And at this point, you have no idea what they're going to use the push notifications from. So a lot of people just click don't allow and then you never have the opportunity to ask them again. Well, I think Steppy Pants is doing a great job here where they wait until asking for the opt-in to push notification when it makes sense. So they send you a gift and then they ask you if you want a reminder for the next gift. And, and then you're like, yeah, I'd like to know that. And then you hit OK. Um, so that is a good way of doing that. So thinking about the first user experience, Try to think differently about how you present them with push notification if you're, if you're doing that. Uh, and push, put it to a later point in the game. So next up, anyone played Super Mario Run? Anyone remembering this part? Anyone remember how much time that took to actually get into the game and play? Six minutes. You must really, really want to play Super Mario Run in order for you to stick around through that whole onboarding process and tutorial, right? And especially when you think about the original game that just threw you straight into the game, placed your character on the left of the screen so that you knew that you had to move to the right to get started. This onboarding was Zero minutes. Um, so back to basic, guys. Um, we actually, when we developed Fun Run 2, we looked at uh, adding a tutorial to the game. And um, through A-B testing, we found that the retention of our user were actually longer if we skipped the tutorial and just threw them straight into a game. And um, we looked into how many game sessions were with friends and how many were with random people and found that 50% were with friends. So that gave us the assumption that once a player downloaded a game, it would be very high likelihood for that person to be sitting next to their friend that would like tell them what to do instead of you actually having to play it through the tutorial and wait until you can actually play with your friends. So with this, Every game is different. Every game requires a different type of onboarding and tutorial and sign up. But just remember that you need to figure out what makes sense for your game and I highly encourage you to A-B test those things. And remember that your players are downloading a game to start to play, not to enjoy your sign up process. And when you actually develop a game, when you think about the game design and the colors and buttons and, and everything as it comes together, you need to make it so that a toddler can understand how to do it, as well as your grandma. And that is actually a really, really good test for you. Give your game to your grandma and see how, what makes sense for her, where she clicks, where she doesn't click, and, and really, like, what if you don't have the, a clear sight? Like, there's so much stuff that you can identify just by having someone um, that is older or younger um, or your friends click through. So pass the grammar test with your games. So a lot of you were probably playing Pokemon Go last summer or observing from a distance look at people uh, looking like this. With Pokemon Go, they were able to take what Ingress had already done, but um, really making people play the game outside and in public. And if you make your game, if you leverage public parts of your game, that is a way for you to spread awareness about your game without controlling it. We did this with Fun Run, as you saw in the video from the cafeteria. Another game that is doing this really well is Space Team. 
I can't even think of a spell. Set meter. Imagine walking by someone playing like that. Wouldn't you get curious and want to join, or at least figure out like what is going on, right? Um, multiplayer games uh, do have an advantage over single-player games here. It's it's obvious, but there are things that you can do. Um, so, like, think very creatively about how to leverage, like, the way to make your game public. Um, so now let's get into more of the word of mouth marketing. Um, it's I like this cartoon here because the boss says, I support word of mouth marketing just as long as we tightly control exactly what they say. Which is more or less the opposite of what you can do with word of mouth marketing. Um, what we found was that you can't really control it, but you can help them, you can amplify the word of, uh, word of mouth by giving your users the tools to do it. And there's a saying that goes like this, images says more than a thousand words. When people talk about it, and you don't have a, gra a graphical uh, resemblance of what they're talking about, it gets harder to remember. But with visuals, it helps. So what we found was that uh, with Fun Run, we could look at Twitter, and we would see a lot of screenshots of this scene here. The user had then screenshotted the screen exit the game, gone to Twitter, uploaded the, the screenshot, uh, typed in some text, shared, exited Twitter, opened the game, continue playing. And we're like, all right, we have so many players doing that already, like super manual um, process by, on their account. What if we could make that smoother and easier? So we added the, the screenshot button up in the corner uh, and we saw tweets coming in every minute after that. It, it was a way f to really like boost that uh, momentum that we already saw. I also think that Crossroad had been doing a great job as this, at this from day one, where they, you could share the impact when you hit a car um, and share that with friends. Uh, and, oh, we need to, we need to settle something once and for all. Is it called GIFs or GIFs? Can I see a raise of hand of who here says GIFs? All right, and then GIF. Sorry, GIF. Uh, it's going to be GIF. All right, so GIF says more than 50 images, or whatever amount of frames you put in it. Um, but taking the crossroad example, if you, reach, if you receive this, you get curious on what just happened. But there's also an element um, where you can actually show what happened. And this is a way to show um, the strategy leading up and how unlucky you were. Like, it wasn't your fault at all that you were run over by the car, right? Um, so the ability to share this is very strong. And then if you look at dots, there, if you make an awesome move, you can then share that on with friends. And by default, they would allow you to share just the, the game over screen or like when you, and, uh, when you finish the game. That doesn't really tell recipients what was going on. Like, yeah, you understand that they won and how many starts they got, but this is where you can actually learn the strategy behind it. So when you're talking about sharing stuff from your game and making that easy, not just let them share anything, but think clearly about what would make that sharing moment personal to your players. There is a lot of generic sharing content, but that is not uh, giving me as the user a reason to complete sharing. Like, I want to share the things that are unique to me and um, something that I am proud of. Uh, so the next tip is then let your players capture and share those personal moments. 
And I think that Steppy Pants, another game, is doing this really, really well because not only are they allowing you to share, but they're making it relevant when you're sharing it. So when you die and you hit a new high score, that is when they prompt you to share. It's not just, so, like they don't tell you to share all the time. This is only happening when you reach a new high score. So when you're thinking about how to allow your users to do the, the word of mouth um, for you, make it relevant uh, when you prompt them. And next one is from Crossroad again. So in Crossroad, uh, they knew that you don't necessarily know every time your user wants to share. So in addition to only prompting them when you know it's relevant, you should have these subtle share buttons in your game so that when a user thinks that this, this is the moment, they have the opportunity to go ahead and share those moments. So make it easy for your players to share. Remove the friction. So what we found was that 60% of all sharing happens to private channels. And uh, the most popular one is messaging. Secondly is email, which is surprising to a lot of people. Third comes Facebook, and then comes Twitter. And you see so many games where there's like a share to Twitter and share to Facebook button in the game. But that isn't necessarily what your user are wanting to do. So this may vary from demographic to demographic somewhat, but the trend is definitely that people don't want to share to public channels as much anymore. Uh, they want to share where it's also relevant for the recipients um, over social media. media. Uh, and another thing is that if you keep metrics on which channel users are sharing to, you can actually allow to optimize for that. So, for instance, if all, the, all your players are choosing to share to, or the majority is choosing to share to iMessage, what about skipping the step of choosing a channel and then sending, uh, rather sending everyone to messaging because that gives you a better conversion and it removes friction from that ch uh, choice process. So you should find a way to optimize uh, which channel is working for you So next up is that for the one thing we found worked really well for a fundraising game uh, was that when you hit the the share button, we actually didn't just like give you a generic um, marketing text like having a blast. We actually went to Twitter and analyzed what are our users already writing, what is the language they're speaking with, and we would find that. They would say, all those guys just got washed, get them in level sun. These were, when, these were actually triggered when you won a game. And then when you catch an L is something we triggered if you, if you did not win. And third, fourth, I just beat a golden fox, which was relevant if you beat the, um, the rare character in the game, uh, which was a golden fox. And we had several others, but these were all triggered based on what just happened. So imagine that you're thinking, oh, cool, I, I want to share something, but um, you don't want to like, have to write down something creative, uh, and then s this pops up, and you're like, yes, that is exactly what I felt this moment. And then it's just like making that whole process so much e more easier for you. So I uh, highly recommend that be creative about a pool of predefined text uh, have it triggered based on different events in your game. And next up, um, games are so much more fun if they're played with friends. So for, um, for Super Mario Run, you would, if you were inviting a friend via, for instance, um, messaging or email, it would look like this. So you get this email, no, mail, uh, sorry, messaging, uh, and you click the link, and it opens up this website that asks you to open up the App Store. And then you open the App Store. Then you go through all the six-minute steps. And then 
you're like, hey, yes, let's play with Aurora. Um, but then you have to send another <laughs> friend request, which is not very smooth. So a way that Super Mario Run could have done this way better uh, is that they could send a message that include, for instance, a GIF, and then when you click the link, you have to go through the app store if you're a new user. But then once you uh, download the game, you're then straight taken into the, um, the session with the opponent. So you can start playing right away. And if, you're re if you already have the game installed, you should totally just skip the middle step. When you click the link, it should open the, um, the app directly. And this is all possible with a new linking technology called deep linking. There's different variations of it, but essentially what it does is that when you click a link, it should add context to the link click experience. So you can be rewarded if you're doing referrals. Uh, you can be matched as friends automatically. You can add like, hey, Aurora was the one inviting you to this game. Um, so you can add context to that, which makes it very powerful. So I highly recommend you to, uh, if you're not already using deep links, to do that. So to summarize, you should give your, uh, your users a reason to opt in to push notification if you're using that and move it to somewhere later in the game. A-B test the onboarding, figure out what, what really works for you. You should make sure to pass the grandma test for your game. And if there's a way for you to make it public then you should do so. And find a way so that your users can capture personal moments from the game. And when they do, you should make it prompt them at relevant places so they're more likely to uh, complete. But also make it easy for them to share if they want to share outside of what you think is relevant. And find out which channels work for you and optimize for that. And find a way to uh, understand how your users are talking about your game so that it can uh, be even more engaging to do the sharing. We actually found users clicking the um, share button a lot of times just to see which different text they will get until they found the right one and then completing share. Uh, and then use deep linking to improve the whole onboarding uh, and re-engagement process. So with this, I really hope that you are, um, are able to create this type of demand for your games, because that would be really, really cool. And um, if you want the slides, please email me. Um, and uh, we are at Megacool, we're opening up our beta soon. So if you're interested in trying out that, let me know. And otherwise- But unfortunately, want... time is cruel, mistress. <laughs> <laughs> I keep doing this to you on stage. No problem. But thank you very much. No worries. Okay. I, I